I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Greg Zuckerman, a special writer at The Wall Street Journal and the author of five books, including his most recent, The Man Who Solved the Market, How Jim Simons Launched the Quant Revolution. Greg joined the journal in 1996 and writes about big financial trades, firms, and personalities. He's a three-time winner of the Gerald Loeb Award, the highest honor in business journalism, and his work has included breaking the stories of the discord between Bill Gross and PIMCO, the London whale trade, subprime mortgage collapse, and meltdown of hedge fund Amaranth. Our conversation starts with Greg's path to journalism and touches on the aftermath of his book, The Greatest Trade Ever, about John Paulson and the subprime meltdown. We then turn to his recent tome on Jim Simons and Renaissance, including the formation and evolution of the Medallion Fund, precarious moments in its history, the human element of a quant shop, differences between Renaissance and other quant competitors, leadership, impacting the world with vast wealth, and why Renaissance has been so special. Please enjoy my conversation with Greg Zuckerman. Greg, thanks so much for joining me. Great to be here. Where did you start in your path as a journalist? As a journalist. So I stumbled into this career. I should have thought about it earlier, but I didn't. So I basically grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, obsessed with markets and investing and business, although my father was an academic and my mother didn't really know that much. So I'm not sure where I got it from. I remember looking at like a Skippy peanut butter jar and the back of it, and it wasn't like Skippy Corporation. It was owned by like Procter & Gamble or something. I'm like, wait, what? There's not like every company, you know, Smuckers and, and everyone's. So I love the interesting idea of putting companies together and brands. And I started thinking about that. And in camp growing up, I would have my counselor bring Barron's back on a day off so I could read that. And I was reading Business Week. I would go to my local bank. We didn't get the Wall Street Journal at home, but my local bank did. So I would sit in the lobby there. So I was always at the business and always thought I'd go work on Wall Street. I went to a good liberal arts school, went to Brandeis University and did well, traveled a little bit, went to work on Wall Street and I couldn't get a job. I didn't know anyone. I hadn't worked like summers or anything. It was a bad time in the industry. If you remember back, this was 1989. And it was like the reverberation of the crash and, and I just wasn't qualified and I could hardly even get an interview, I remember. So I started some businesses, some succeeded to some extent, most failed. I tried to look for a career. And then one day I went in, I looked for an ad in, in the newspaper, they had jobs in, back then in newspapers, there was an ad to work for a financial trade publication it's called Mergers and Acquisitions Report, just one of these like trades that charges a lot and few people read it. And I had, had no clips. I had nothing to show them. I didn't work at my school. I went to a little Jewish school. I didn't have any high school newspaper growing up. I didn't work in college newspaper. And so they gave me a, a leaked document, a pretend leaked document. And they said, go write a story about this. And I remember sitting there thinking, wait, they'll pay me to write about Wall Street? How cool is that? I love Wall Street. And I don't really have the temperament to be a trader. I take things home. I maul and, and analyze and I'm a little neurotic. So I love Wall Street and I love writing too. I'm, and always been into newspapers. My mother was obsessed with newspaper reader. We get you know, the afternoon paper, the morning paper. So I was like, wow, this is what I should be doing. And I sort of just stumbled into it. And in truth of the matter is my writing wasn't very good, but they said you could work on that. And, and I did. What I was good at apparently was just talking to people on the phone and getting information. And it's because I'm actually interested in the topic. So that's how I stumbled into financial journalism. And you stayed all the way through. Yeah, so I was at that little newsletter for a few years and I broke some stories and it's tough to break stories when no one's heard of the publication. So then I went from there to the New York Post and that was just an absolute blast. I was covering the media business, working for Rupert Murdoch. I quickly figured out that every negative story I wrote about Rupert's competitors was getting really good placement in the paper. So I did a lot of those. I broke a story about, you might remember, about Michael Ovitz and Michael Eisner warring behind the scenes. And back then, Ovitz was the heir apparent. He was going to take over at, at Disney. 
And Disney said, no, Zuckerman, you're wrong. If it was true, the LA Times and the Journal would have had this story. And I felt bad and I thought maybe I blew it, but lo and behold, they did split up. And so that was a good story. And then I got the call or, or I heard about a job opening at the Wall Street Journal. I always wanted to, you know, if, if you're a financial journalist, you want to work at the Wall Street Journal, sort of the Yankees of journalism. So yeah, then I switched over there. I've been there ever since 1996. Yeah. And so do you have a certain perspective or set of beliefs about the asset management industry? Sure. They've evolved over time. I sort of went into this business, I guess, to some extent, looking up to the storied investors. And I put them on a pedestal to some extent. And over time, I've become much more cynical. Uh, (laughs) Partly because, well, their returns have gotten worse. The market's become more competitive. I mean, you know about the stuff. It's harder to get an information advantage. They charge way too much. I'm getting older, so that's part of the cynicism as well. So some of those principles are that people charge way too much, but people are generally not bad people on Wall Street. I think there's an assumption from others outside that everyone's out to do bad things. I wrote a book earlier about the financial crisis, the meltdown in 2008, and you know, most people assume that the banks were out to screw the homeowners. And I don't think that's the case. I'm not saying they're not blameless. So while I've become more cynical, I do also appreciate the talent on the street. And generally speaking, you want, as a society, you want talented people allocating capital where it should be. So we have an advantage over others. I've, I've traveled and I've written different books and such. And we as a nation uh, have a real competitive advantage over others because of these capital markets. Before we dive into your book on Jim Simons and Renaissance, I want to touch a little bit on The Greatest Trade Ever, the book you wrote about subprime mortgages and John Paulson in particular, two very different investment styles. How have you followed John Paulson to what he did afterwards? You know the trade as well as as anybody. So I've always viewed what John Paulson did as not so much getting bearish about housing. I don't give him that much credit for that necessarily. As you know, there were a lot of people bearish about housing way before John Paulson. So I give him much more credit for figuring out the way to express that bearishness. And if anything, he lucked into the fact that he didn't know much about mortgages or CDS or housing less than most people. So he got to the trade at the perfect time after other people had been flushed out. So on the one hand, I don't give him as much credit as maybe some other people. Yeah, he made $20 billion over 2007 and 2008, but I don't think he was some sort of, he's got had this ability to see the, into the future that others didn't. What I am impressed by is that he was a 50-year-old guy who threw himself into, along with his colleague, Pablo Pellegrini, figuring out CDS contracts. And there were a lot of guys on the street who didn't know how to do that, didn't think it was appropriate for them. That wasn't the kind of thing. We can get into the negative carry, et cetera. So I give him a lot of credit. And then subsequently to your question, he changed his investing style. So not even just with the greatest trade ever, even earlier, he was a guy who did merger arbitrage, but he often got into positions that had lots of upside and limited downside. Potential third parties would come in for the acquisitions and there were asymmetrical trades. And that's what especially was. And that's why it's the greatest trade ever because it had limited downside. You were buying CDS protection and you had tremendous upside. I'm not saying there wasn't any downside, but it was relatively limited. And he got away from that completely. Make the tr- he made the classic mistake of the overconfident investor, too much AUM. And he started doing things like bank stocks and pharma stocks and gold. What are they worth? I don't know, maybe, you know, gold especially. How do you value that? So he got away from making asymmetrical trades. He made the classic mistake of getting overly confident and got away from what he always did his whole career. Do you think in the work you did on that book, there were signs that you might have been able to figure out from his personality or otherwise that he'd be subject to that type of change? At the end, I sort of raised questions about the gold. He got into gold at the end. And what is gold worth? It's hard to put a valuation on that. And that's clearly not an asymmetrical trade. But no, I don't think he's not one of these guys that throws his money around and is comfortable with risk. So it wasn't like there was some telltale sign there of somebody who was going to change his approach, but he's human. <laughs> so when someone writes a book called The Greatest Trade Ever about what you've done and you know it does pretty well and all that, and people give you all kinds of credit, you start thinking, maybe I can master pharma stocks and gold stocks and 
in bank stocks. So you know, I, nothing that I, in hindsight I could see that suggests that he was going to have poor returns for the next decade. Well, let's turn to someone who that clearly hasn't happened to and you know, certainly may not <laughs> just because of this terrific book you put together. Why don't we start with your perspective on Jim Simons and his path through his career? Sure. So Jim Simons is a fascinating individual. Even if he had never invested a dime in the market, I would argue he's still worthy of a book because before he started trading full-time in 1978, he was one of the most acclaimed mathematicians, especially as a geometer over the past 50, maybe even 100 years. His work today still gets citations all the time. It has impact lots of areas, physics elsewhere. And he's just an interesting individual. He broke code for the government. So I'm skipping around here, but basically grew up middle class, Boston suburb, got a PhD and at Berkeley in mathematics, went to MIT before that. Then he taught at MIT and Harvard. And he's an interesting guy because on the one hand, he's a mathematician and later he's a quant, so he can do that side of things. But he's also got these interests and passions in the real world. Unlike many of the people that I dealt with, and I did a lot of research for this book and talked to all kinds of mathematicians from back in the day, and they kind of looked down on him when he said, oh, in 1978, I'm going to quit academia to go trade. But Simons doesn't care. And he didn't care what people think then and today. But more importantly, he's unique because, again, he's the academic, he's a quant, but he's also, he loves money and he's not ashamed of that whatsoever. He always was kind of looking to trade on the side and not so much interested in business. He really didn't care about business and how companies worked and why Skippy is owned by Procter & Gamble or whatever like I was. But he does like money, loves money, and he loves the real world. And he's a guy who can you can have a beer with, you can assuming you can deal with the smoke in your face, like I did. <laughs> um, you know, he's Jim Simons. You don't tell him to put out his cigarette. So he's a, to me, is a fascinating guy. He, he deals with people well. He manages well. We can get into it. But he's one of the – I think that's part of the reason why the returns have been so – ridiculous is that he's a unique breed. He could do both, the, the quant side, the mathematics side, but also the personal and relate to people and manage people. So let's walk through a little bit of the history of the Renaissance Medallion Fund. First, basically, he starts trading and he has a sense that there's some structure in the market. And it's probably just an instinct on his part. He's a scientist and that's what they're trying to do, look for structure beneath the surface. When everybody else sees chaos, look for some patterns. And he thought there were currencies. It was really currencies early on. And he thought he could find some patterns and make some money. And for years, they sort of, he went back and forth. He would hire these top name mathematicians, somehow persuade them to join him. I mean, they weren't people that cared about trading, didn't care about investing. Their own spouses were often were the ones doing their personal investing. They didn't really care about getting rich. My contention is once you get there, you want to get rich. But first, you got to get them in the door. And so Simons would do these things like, oh, just come over once a week and help me out on this problem. And that's how he would do it. But it would appeal to their intellectual curiosity and present it as a challenge, mathematical challenge and others. So yeah, early on, he wanted to be a quant. He wanted to develop models. But early in, in their tenure, he was working with a guy, Lenny Baum, was a really famed mathematician, even more famous than Simons. Uh, Baum Welch is a famous algorithm. And they developed a system, an automated type system, early trading model, and it cornered the market for main potatoes. It was just one example of they messed up. They couldn't get it done. And he became a macro trader, not unlike everybody else, picking up the newspaper, trying to anticipate the news. He hired this young economist as a consultant named Alan Greenspan, and he had his red phone that went off when news broke, and they would try to beat everybody else in trading kind of thing. And it left him literally sick to his stomach. He couldn't take the ups and downs. He felt like a dope when he lost money and a hero when he made money. And then he came back and he said, you know, let's see if we're mathematicians. Let's see if we can figure out this mathematical approach, developing algorithms. I mean, and this is, we're talking the mid and late 80s when no one was talking about predictive How much algorithms. capital were they managing back then? It wasn't much. It was maybe about 50 or so million dollars, if that. They went up and down. They made a lot of money sometimes with this macro kind of trading, gold and silver, then they lost a lot of it. So sometimes there'd be more money. And frankly, it's called Renaissance Technologies because he was focused on other things at the same time, including venture capital. And 
he did some interesting venture capital type investing on the side, and it wasn't clear which direction the firm would go. It wasn't even clear they were going to be a trading firm until, I would argue, 1990, when there was a, a turning point and they they got a better sense of how they should be trading and more short-term orientation. They went from 80-20 long-term to short-term and they flipped it around 80-20 short-term. So they went back and forth through a lot of fits and starts. And frankly, that was one of the surprises of my research. I thought with this kind of trading record, they'd sort of figure it out early on, be the early quants, but and now off to the races, but it wasn't like that. And how short-term was short-term for them back in 1990? You know, what's interesting is it wasn't so dissimilar from what it is today. We're talking on average about two days and people lump them in with high frequency and they're not, but it's not to suggest they do it as they do it back then, but we're talking a few days on average, sometimes less, sometimes more moments to months is how they say it internally today. And it wasn't so dissimilar back then. What was the process in the early nineties for gathering data? They were unique in that Jim had a sense that data would be important. And this is way before big data and that whole theme. He would send people literally out scouring books, world books, um, the Federal Reserves, their basement, jotting down information. And the data back then was all pricing data. Later, they added other kind of stuff. What they were doing wasn't so different from technical analysis. I mean, we all sort of poo-poo and we kind of look at it as alchemy and hocus pocus, but they saw themselves as maybe more sophisticated, more scientific approach to technical analysis in that they were looking for pricing patterns. They thought if they had data, and at this point they were doing commodities, they were doing bond futures and currencies, if they had better data and cleaner data than everybody else, then they could find more reliable repeating price patterns. And again, cleaning data, who was cleaning data back then and who cared so much about it? And it was partly Jim Simons, but it was also his colleagues, this guy, Sandor Strauss, who was maybe one of the first early data scientists, you can really argue. And that was really even in 1985, his passion was to collect and to clean data. Even when Simons and other people weren't telling him to, he was focused on cleaning it. So in those early years, there probably weren't as many people You had Bar Rosenberg back then. There were a few other quants. There weren't as many people doing it. Was it their mathematical modeling in the early years plus this data that was just an advantage? Or were there also these kind of special insights that we may not know what they are, but were present back then? There are other people like Ed Thorpe doing it as well. You have to give those people credit. But Simons and his colleagues were quite early And Henry Laufer was the key guy. So he was a mathematician, a very quiet, humble, really super smart, well-respected and almost acclaimed in that field. And he's the one who came up with different approaches, things like days of the week, comparing what trades worked on what days of the week, what patterns are out there. Do you get in Friday before the close and get back out Monday? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Which markets do you do it? Correlations between different things like gold and silver, Pat, during the day, they started looking at the day in different bands, and they started with the larger bands. They got all the way down to five-minute bands. So does the 30-second band on a Tuesday usually go up in this investment while the 34th goes down? And they were looking for patterns that most others couldn't figure out, and that's partly because they were mathematicians who had a sense for the structure and developing models that could, on their own, eventually do trading. So in somewhere along the way, it's working and it's sort of reaching the bounds of capacity. And there's this inflection point where they say, we need to figure out the equity markets. Yeah, it wasn't really they, it was Jim. So basically in 1994, they were doing well. They were managing about $700 million at that point. And for a while, we're talking 1990, 1991, they couldn't raise money from people. They were seen as black box. He's out in Long Island, Jim Simons. Didn't really have a great track record, or at least a long track record. Really, 1988 is when they started the Medallion Fund, and 1990 was a very poor year, a down year. So they didn't have a long track record. This approach wasn't very popular. But Simons kept with it, and they started figuring out commodities and currencies and bond futures, but they could not make equities work. And so, again, 1994, they're managing about seven, $800 million. And people at the firm were satisfied. They were making nice money. But it wasn't enough for Simons. And people around him wonder why. There's a thesis on people close, family members and others, that he wanted to be really, really rich. And that way he could impact society. 
and eventually he would impact society. So they had this sense that it wasn't enough. Being wealthy wasn't enough. You wanted to be uber rich, really super rich. And the only way to do that was with equities because there's a, a limit to some of these currencies and commodity markets, soybeans and such. It's just so big you can your AUM can get. And Simon's knew we have to figure out equities if we want to be really big and billionaires, et cetera. So that was really an interesting challenge for them. And they could not. They spent a long time figuring out equities. And Simon's almost pulled the plug. He gave his guy six months and he goes, guys, that's it. We're going to pull the plug. I'll give you six more months. And was there anything that you picked up that happened for – the guys who really figured out equities at Renaissance? Well, it took outsiders. It took this group of uh, individuals from IBM, Bob Mercer, who went on to fame and fortune as a big backer for Donald Trump and the hard right, and his colleague, Peter Brown. And they too weren't really focused on getting rich at the time. They were just at personal turning points in their lives and needed something new. And he came over to work with Simons and they were tasked with figuring out equities. They had earlier brought over a guy named Robert Fry and he was a Morgan Stanley veteran and they had made some progress. It was almost like they had on paper their system, their equities trading system should have worked. It seemed to be a system that was quite promising, but when they applied the trades, it never did. And they were getting quite frustrating, as I suggested. Really, the key was this younger, really unlikely programmer named David Magerman, who was on his last leg. He had messed up over and over again at the firm. No, he was really unpopular for a lot of good reasons. And he was up late at night trying to figure out what the problem was, and he found this glitch. He found a screw up on the part of Bob Mercer, who was a super duper programmer, but he had messed up. There's a number that wasn't updating. It was an S&P 500 number that was static. And it was really more their hedging and their offsetting trades. And it just was messing everything up. And Magerman's like, hey, boss, I think you messed up here. I think this number should be updating and it's not. And Mercer acknowledged he screwed up and they were off to the races. What was it about the way they were investing in the equity markets that worked? I think the answer is that they invested then and also today in a very different way than most everybody else. Their goal is to find relationships among equities. So today, and it's not so dissimilar from what it was back then, today it's about four or 5,000 stocks that are long, four or 5,000 stocks that are short. They'll look for groups of relationships between this group and another group, between this group and an index, between a group and a factor model. So they don't even know the companies involved. They find that distracting. It's one of the lessons that I've learned is how we can all get caught up in the narrative. They don't get caught up in any narratives. They don't even know what they're doing. Well, at this point, now we're skipping ahead a little bit. But even back then, the idea was to find relationships among stocks as opposed to predicting where any would go. It's not pairs trading. It started off as pairs trading, but it's much, much more sophisticated level. But you know, to simplify it and dumb it down, it's something like pairs trading. But now it's every kind of, it's not equities. It's not like Ford versus GM. I want to go through some of the lessons you pull out of the book with some of these great stories. And the first is something you'd mentioned earlier, which is when Simon started trying to raise outside money in the early 90s, this strategy just wasn't popular. There was this kind of contrarian streak that he had. You talked about, well, Peter Lynch was popular and George Soros was popular. To what degree does that streak of contrarianism filter through both Jim and the organization? They are outsiders. It's the paradox that's behind my book. It should not have been Jim Simons and this group of mathematicians and scientists who figured out investing. It should have been somebody like me who, who was obsessed with investing. And it's not to say that I'm any good at it. And, and yeah, journal has all kinds of restrictions, so I don't really trade. But somebody who was interested in markets from birth, someone who read, you know, Buffett, Adam Smith, I remember growing up, Graham, you know, the classics, they know none of those guys read the classics about investing. It should not have been Jim Simons and these groups. Some of these people internally aren't even sure about capitalism. They're libertarians. They're all kinds of quirky people who I've met who work there today and over the years. Fascinating. Some are liberal, some are hard right. So being an outsider, maybe it does help. And maybe this different approach, you needed to have a different approach. I mean, it's true of all my work. I find that all these outsiders time and time again 
succeed. You know, I wrote a book about the energy revolution and it's called the frackers and it should have been BP and Exxon and all those guys that found all the oil in this country. It wasn't. Those guys had given up on America. They were offshore in Asia and it took some unlikely characters and John Paulson was unlikely. He was a merger arb. He's the one that made the most money on the mortgage meltdown. The guy didn't know anything about mortgages. He owned a home or two over the years. So Maybe I'm just drawn to those stories. I don't know. I'm a little bit of an outsider myself, you could argue. So yes, I do think, getting back to your question, I do think it helped Simons. He doesn't hire from Wall Street. He never has interest. If you worked on Wall Street, it's hard to get a job there. And that helps because when they leave, people don't usually go to Wall Street. So I don't know if, I think he stumbled onto this. I don't think he did this intentionally, but it, it helped keep their IP secret because you make a lot of money at, at Medallion at Renaissance. And then you're not going to go work at D.E. Shaw afterwards. You go retire and buy an Alps or something. As we look out, one of the things that comes up, certainly with the Medallion Fund, is this issue of capacity. Did you have a sense of how they figured out what that capacity would be? Because it's certainly grown. It used to be $5 billion, Now today it's ten. Yeah. I didn't. No. And they use leverage on top of that, sometimes as much as 10 to 1 or, or more, depending on the opportunities and such. So their internal measures suggested that they couldn't, at one point, was they were sure they couldn't get bigger than $5 billion. And then, yeah, now they're at $10 billion. I don't have any sense that they think they can expand it. And what's happened with Reef? I know when it first started, it started at a tough time. It was going to be the first $100 billion fund. Money was rushing in. And then that just stopped. Yeah. Early on, people were just throwing money at that thing. And I have some, I think, funny scenes in the book where people didn't really care about Jim Simon's smoking in their face. This was a- Well, uh, why don't you tell the story that Robert Wood Johnson- Oh, really? Yeah. So there was the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They're dedicated to health care and improving the nation's health. And they were out in Long Island at their offices looking at an investment in Reef. This Reef was this outside fund that finally, Renaissance is finally taking outside money. Medallion has been really only Jim Simons and his employees since around 2003 that kicked the last people out. So people have been hungering to get in. Those returns are crazy. So yeah, the Robert Wood Johnson individuals that came over, they met with Simons. They're about to sign a check and hand over a, a nice chunk of money. And they're having lunch. And Simons gets up to leave because, you know, he did his thing. He talked to these LPs and time to move on. And of course, he's smoking. And the people internally in the room are a little uncomfortable. Who smokes anymore? And this is back in 2000, I think, six or seven. But even that, you know, you don't smoke indoors. And Simons doesn't really care. He's 81. What does he care? And he looks around and there's nowhere to ash. He's got to put out a cigarette somewhere and he sees this big beautiful cake in the center of the table and he's Jim Simons he's got to put a cigarette out somewhere so he buries that cigarette deep into that cake and he's like all right see you guys I'm out here and he walks out and everyone's aghast it's sizzling it's literally sizzling right in front of them this cake their cigarette buried in the cake and the Renaissance employees, the salespeople, they were like, oh, we lost this huge contract. Why would the Robert Wood Johnson now give us any money? He just put cigarette right out in front of them and sizzling in their face. And yet they did <laughs> because it's Renaissance and, and, and Jim Simons and everyone wanted a piece of it. And that was 2007. But then as you suggest, right away, that fund hit real problems, the refund. And it took a few years before they turned it around. But in the last bunch of years, I'd say five to seven years, it's been fine. It's been steady. It's outperformed its benchmarks. It's not anything close to the medallion fund. They're a key fund, which again is 66% a year. But Reef does a nice job in terms of volatility and returns, and they're pleased with it. So they've ironed those problems out. The other piece of it is it's easy to look at Renaissance today and say, man, these guys created the ultimate money machine. They're cranking out returns year in, year out, returning the capital. There are a number of instances you walk through in the book where the business itself, the investment model, was just at a precarious point. So you mentioned like Jim giving the team six months to figure out equities or he's going to shut that down. And then he said, if you shut it down, it probably is a much smaller fund. And the equity model being this like problem in the code. Where are the other examples that you saw of, you know, Renaissance easily not being able to be the subject of this book that you wrote? That was one of my fears writing this book. They've got these returns 66% a year before fees, only 39% after fees. Yeah, after their five and 44 fees. So my fear was where's the drama here? Where's the tension? Where are the setbacks? And then the relief to me, not necessarily to the people internally, is that there were, as you suggest, these 
really difficult point where it could have gone either way. So specifically, there were many times before this, but in 2007, the quant quake. So if you think about it, if you or I, or you know, a traditional type fundamental investor, if you're losing a lot of money rapidly over several days, it's scary for sure, but you at least know why you know this bet went awry and you kind of have a sense for why usually it's scarier when you don't know why you're suffering remarkably dramatic losses which is what happened in that august period and one can say well yeah okay it was just like a week so big deal but that's not how it felt internally because again they were losing hundreds of millions of dollars suddenly for no apparent reason it happened also in 2000, when the NASDAQ had that turn, they didn't know why they were losing money. It's a scary feeling to be suffering so much, losing so much so quickly. You you think it could be, that's it. We're done. If this could go on, why shouldn't it? Because we have no idea why we're losing the money. And that's partly because machine learning is at the heart of the firm in modern times. And they were making trades without realizing why they were making the trades. The, the system teaches itself. And then they had to figure out what the problem was. They went back and figured it out. And Simon's, when he gives speeches, to, he talks about the key is they never override the model. And they don't usually override the model, almost never do. But as I write in this story in the book, there are times when Simons has stepped in and said, guys, we're taking off risk here. We're not putting on these trades. And people internally get pretty pissed off. And they're scientists and they're not as emotional sometimes as some others. And they're like, no, this looks like a good trade. LTCM, we should double down here. And Simons is a little bit old school in, in that regard. He always kept these traders still around. It's not all electronic. And people internally, some were like, why do we have these guys around? Or women, maybe. And Simon's, you know, he's 81. He's seen some things in his life. He's not beholden to the model. Neither others within the firm, and they seen that as a distinction with LTCM. So yeah, there were many times when it could have gone either way. Well, that's a sort of a fascinating question of when and how many times Jim overrides the model. Because- you assume, you could look at this long record, yep, we just keep the model running under all circumstances. But in fact, as you mentioned, certainly in 07, there are times where he did take off risk. Yeah. Listen, I don't want to overstate it. I write about those examples in the book. There's drama involved and tension, but most of the time, no. He's a quant and he believes in his models and he lets them do their thing. And that's the ethos within the firm as well. There's been this... Interesting question. It's not hard to read the book, certainly from outside the industry, and say, wow, these guys are different from almost everybody else. Inside the industry, you, know, you mentioned D. Shaw or Two Sigma. There are other quants that presumably are trying to attack markets in the same way, and yet Renaissance has had dramatically more success. Did you get a chance to talk to some of those other funds and get a sense of what might be different? Yeah. So let me give a couple of reasons. First is, let's be clear about quant. So I'm a writer. I work at the Wall Street Journal. I write about the buy side and lately I've been writing about quant. But even I coming into this, I sort of painted this brush quants. You know, it's this big industry. There's so many different types of approaches to quant, as many of your audience will be aware. And it was made clear to me. So things like AQR, they're just so different from what Renaissance does. And quite frankly, there aren't that many firms that do what they do. And when I, to be specific, I'm talking about medium frequency type trades, not high frequency, not factor investing, not other approaches that other quants do. You do have, as you suggest, like a two sigma, a few others. D. Shaw does it a little bit, medium. But first off, they don't have as much competition as you would think. For various reasons, you know, AKR guys there get wealthy doing their approach and whatever. Everybody does it a different way. They've got clients who don't want the black box approach. Their clients want to know why they're winning and losing, that kind of thing. So A, the competition isn't quite as great as you might think. B, the talent level is just different. And up and down Wall Street today, everybody's got PhDs. Everybody talks about their PhDs. I joke in the book about how it used to be that MBAs said, oh, I could hire a programmer if I need one today. They say, the programmers say that about, about MBAs. You can say the same thing about these PhDs everywhere. Everyone's, oh, come in my, a tour of my office. In that corner office over there is our PhD. And he used to be a scientist. It's the level of talent at Simons' place is just heads and tails above everyone else. What I mean by that is they're not just PhDs. And yeah, they have 100 out of like 300 people there. They're PhDs. These are people that are groundbreaking scientists, physicists, 
astronomers. He loves to, to hire astronomers. I have to be careful I don't say astrologers. He does not hire astrologers. So these are guys who are just groundbreaking, running departments, Stanford University, David Donahue. These are people that are just brand names in those fields. And Simon somehow, or now it's not Simon, it's, it's Mercer, it's more Brown. They get them to come on over there. So the talent level is actually much greater. They also do things like they embrace non-intuitive signals, signals that they don't really know why they work, but they're scientifically proven. And lots of other firms are uncomfortable with that approach. I don't want to overdo it here. That's not a bulk of their trading. They ease into those. They put a little bit of money into those and they try to figure it out. It's also the case that they are much more collegial. They work together. It's an open system. Everyone can see the code as opposed to other technology firms, other hedge funds. And there aren't many different models. So you look at like a to Sigma, my understanding is they have a lot of different trading models, and there are many fewer at Renaissance. These are a lot of the different races. So, you know, people read the book and they're like, Craig, I didn't get this. You know, on Amazon, you get sort of like individual traders or something. Craig, I didn't read the algorithm that'll tell me how to make a lot of money. Well, yeah, that's not it. And whatever algorithm I would write today, and you know, I've said to Jim, Jim, give me your best algorithm. First of all, I wouldn't understand it. Second of all, next week it may not work. So, or they're always updating and working on it. And there's a sense of urgency within the firm. It's a fascinating place because it's collegial, but there's pressure internally. They feel this, this pressure, despite the fact that there's so much wealth there. Over the last 10 years, a lot of what you wrote about in the book, which we'll talk about, is sort of what happens when they accumulate this great wealth. What's happened on the investment side over the last 10 years? So I'll speak specifically to maybe the last two, three years where we've all seen remarkable change on Wall Street, where passive investing and index investing, et cetera, has become so important. So to me, and this is what I've posed to people internally who are there right now, and thank God some of them talk to me, not entirely sure why, but I, I appreciate it. So I've posed to them is, well, the basis of their profits is taking advantage of the behavior of investors. And early on, and I write in the book, they didn't really know why they're making money. Their thesis was thrown out sort of half jokingly, but half seriously, is there are a lot of dentists they were making money from, you know, these overconfident, unexperienced investors who are prone to make uh, mistakes, greed and fear, et cetera, all the behavioral mistakes we read about. But then later they figured now nah, it's probably other institutions. But again, it was often people not like themselves. And now, A, the market is changing. You've got passive investing. So you would think you don't have as many dentists. When you go to a barbecue or somewhere, you don't hear people talk about pets.com anymore. And, you know, my favorite stock is whatever. I don't know what they're talking about. Maybe Bitcoin a little bit or they just give it. They're smart. These small investors, so much smarter than the institutional investor. They've shifted to 60-40 Vanguard index funds and they don't worry about it as much. So what I've posted to people internally is how do you guys continue to profit as the market changes like that. And also, you've got more quant competition. So 31% of quant trading today is from quantitative traders. And it's almost like the dumb money has left the table, the poker table, and you're going up against the sophisticated guys. So the answer they've given me is, yes, the market is changing, but it's changing slowly. If it was overnight, then we would be in trouble probably. But we're still finding phenomenon. And there's still enough trading done by individuals and there's still patterns that repeat that we can find. But it does raise questions about the future and I'm not convinced they can continue these kind of returns. 2019, it's not in the book, but 2019 has been a good year for them. So they somehow have been able to do it. But you know, I'm a, a jaded, cynical reporter and, and I've written about John Paulson and I didn't do him any favors afterwards and, and the frackers have problems afterwards too. So you know, I don't mean to bring any bad luck to Renaissance and Jim Simons, but we'll see how they do going forward. What kind of a leader is Jim? He's remarkable, actually. So he doesn't get enough credit as a manager. He has a way, and, and listen, he doesn't run things day to day. So this is over the course of his history when he established the firm and established some of the culture within the firm. But he motivates people in a remarkable way. He knows how, and this is even going back. So I write about how he started a department, the math department at SUNY Stony Brook, and he recruited from all over the country. He got this guy, Jim Max, who was a Cornell, the youngest tenured professor at Cornell, and he somehow got him to leave to go work at Stony Brook. Back then, no one cared about Stony Brook. And it's similar at the firm where he's able to attract talent and he knows what motivates people. He knows 
Some people want an intellectual problem. Some people want to work with colleagues on something. He knows how to get to them. And he also creates incentives within the firm that I don't think other firms do. So in other words, the, the guy or the woman who's collecting data or cleaning data, internally, I talk to the people who've worked there and they say those people get rewarded if they're good and they play a role, not just the researchers who come up with the signals. People, you know, they're just as focused. A lot of my book is obviously the signals and the trading, but their impact on the market. There's no one who does a better job of figuring out when to trade, how to put on trades. They look like high frequency sometimes because they layer into positions. They know slippage. They, they, early 90s, going back to Henry Lyle, for early 90s, they were figuring out their slippage, how much they were impacting their investments when they were buying. And that's half the game. That's really, and that was one thing I was kind of surprised. They, they're just as focused on that kind of stuff, the risk management, et cetera. So in terms of as a leader, he's great at recruiting talent and getting them to work together. When Mercer and Brown came in and cracked the code on the equity market, it seems like the perception is that Jim is the brains. You know, you've described it as he's this great leader and manager of people. To what extent do you think his mathematical genius impacted each of the sort of signals that went into the trading strategy? And how much was it just he hired a couple people who figured it out? So another reaction on Amazon not that I obsess over it, not at all. One of the reactions is, well, Greg, it, it says the man who solved the market, but half the book is about these other guys. I, I, it's not all about Simons. And yes, that is true. In some ways, I was surprised that he didn't come up with the algorithms most of the time, but he's great at asking questions and prodding and pushing and have you considered this? You might want to try this approach. So People internally say his genius is managing genius and getting people on the same page. And I've kind of suggested to people internally, play devil's advocate to some extent, well, geez, he gets paid a billion and a half dollars a year today for not doing anything. And back then he was making a fortune. Maybe he doesn't deserve it given that he didn't come up with most of these algorithms. And they say, you know, these are cutthroat people as much as anywhere else. They say, no, 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 he deserves what he's, the 23 billion that he's racked up because he created the culture and the recruiting and he asked the right questions. And because of little things along, I write in the book, little things like risk management and getting out of the prime brokers that were in danger at the right time, dealing with clients when, when things were difficult positions. So he can do the math and he is a quant and he understands the approach they have, but he also just is great at developing that culture internally. So now that he's sort of stepped away from the firm and it still continues to go and crank on, what does the future of Renaissance look like? They worry about talent and competing for talent, and they don't see themselves as competing with D. Shaw and Two Sigma, et cetera. They compete with Facebook and Google. They see themselves as a technology company. And that was part of the reason, and we're skipping ahead a little bit, but part of the reason why Simons had to step in and get Bob Mercer to step down as co-CEO, not because their politics differed and he didn't like the fact that Bob Mercer played a huge role, maybe the most important role in putting Trump in the White House, but because morale was being hurt and recruiting, they were worried about recruiting. They were going to lose two people that were key, but they were also worried about recruiting. So yeah, the future is, a, can they keep recruiting these people out in Long Island, mathematicians, scientists, who really don't care so much about trading and such, and non-Wall Street people. Again, the returns the last few years have been very good. This year, they're good. But it's not clear, again, they can keep this thing going. Let's go on that tangent of people and culture. There have been a couple of examples, and a notable one in the book, of people who left Renaissance and presumably had access to the code and went to sort of go on in their lives. What was your perception of, on the one hand, you have this collaborative teamwork approach. And on the other hand, there's one guy in particular who, when he was there, was pretty disruptive as a person, despite being a very talented mathematician and additive to the business. So until the early 2000s, it was still a relatively small place, fewer than 200 people. It's a crazy thing. I mean, they're making so much money. Today, it's over, you know, if you add it all up, it's over $100 billion dollars over the course of their lives, seven billion a year before everything. It's crazy. And yet, even today, it's only 300. But back then, it was under 200 people. So it was relatively small. And then they started expanding. 
partly because they started these outside funds, Reef and, and others, and I get into why. I, I would argue that it's, it was partly a distraction for Jim. He had lost his two sons tragically and needed a distraction of his own. He also needed to keep some of his new talent occupied. They would make a lot of money, et cetera. I get into it in the book. But yeah, at some point, they brought in outside people, a lot of foreign computer scientists and others, even some people that had worked on Wall Street. And it did lead to tension, it lead to problems. I would argue that the culture isn't as collegial as it used to be, but it's still as collegial as anywhere else, probably more than other places. And frankly, it's bigger now, 320 or so, 330 people. So it's hard to be as collegial as when you're much smaller, 150 people. So yeah, things have changed, but I would still argue that they've got a unique culture where even a junior person can see their code. It's a remarkable thing. Even other companies like Google and Facebook, my understanding is that there are corners of the code that only the founders can see. I believe I've been told that. I don't know if that's the case. At Renaissance, it's so different. And as you suggest, there's a huge danger. If a junior guy can see their IP, he can walk out the door. And again, I don't think Simon's was conscious about this. He lucked into it. So he had good fortune. But because they make so much money and because these people aren't from Wall Street, they don't have much incentive. If you have made a lot of money and you're more interested in academics or maybe maybe changing the world, doing some philanthropy, why are you going to go work for D.E. Shaw? What's the point? And yes, so it's happened. I write about it here and there in the book, but it's rare. So then there's the other side, which is, yes, they've made these extreme amounts of wealth. And as a result, can spend it and do things that impact the world, as you mentioned Jim originally wanted to do. Why don't you walk through how that evolves, particularly with Jim and Bob Mercer? The first half or two-thirds of the book is Simon's and then how he and his colleagues made a lot of money. But then the last part is what they did with it. And because they're very different personalities, they did very different things with it. So early on, Jim Simon's was affected. He rode around the country with his friend and was affected by seeing difficult circumstances people in our nation were living under, minorities especially, and it affected him. And he became a left of center. I won't necessarily call him progressive or liberal, but he's a left of center guy, and he supports left of center politics. He also became very active in philanthropy in terms of universities, autism research. He is the biggest funder of autism research, and frankly, they may come up with, I don't think a cure, but maybe treatment in the next number of years. And it be large part due to Jim Simons. I really think that he maybe go down and be remembered as much for some of these philanthropies as other things. He's behind math and science education. He subsidizes math teachers in New York City and New York State, gives them 10000 or I think $15,000 each, the top ones. And so that they don't leave to go to private industry places like Renaissance. <laughs> a little irony there. So he was doing that kind of stuff, but others had other passions. So Bob Mercer, who became the co-CEO of the firm, is a conservative guy. He believed that an outsider was needed in terms of winning the GOP nomination in 2016 and in terms of changing the country. So first he got behind Ted Cruz, and then after his daughter Rebecca had lunch, with sandwiches and salad with Ivanka Trump. They switched their allegiance to to Donald Trump and they saved the campaign because it was floundering during the summer of 2016. We remember the whole Billy Bush incident and such. And Rebecca Mercer went to Donald Trump personally at a fundraiser and said, you've got to hire these two individuals that work for us, Kellyanne Conway and Steve Bannon. And that they really stabilized and saved the campaign. And he got behind other kind of causes too, stopping a mosque around 9-11, I supported Brexit. So Bob Mercer became a really interesting guy. And yeah, when you've got billions at your disposal, you can have impact on society. And some would argue too much. Even Simons and Mercer, both of them, you could argue they shouldn't have this kind of impact. But that's where we are in the United States today. And then how did that play out in terms of like the impact on the business? Well, it took time because for years, people thought of Bob Mercer more as an oddity and an amusing guy internally. He would, over lunch in the lunchroom there, they all get together often, like in an academic situation, they get together and eat together. And Mercer would sort of start picking on the liberals and make provocative statements and try to get under their skin. And usually he was good natured and he didn't mean anything by it. But over time, it became more difficult for people to take. And when they realized he was not just an amusing 
sometimes difficult right wing guy who's actually funding some causes that no one believed in. And, and it's an interesting group because you've got, I think I said it earlier, you've got left wing people, right wing people, libertarians, all kinds of people internally. And yeah, slowly but surely morale was being hurt when it became clear what Bob Mercer was doing in terms of funding some of these hard right Breitbart. So there are all kinds of really bad, or some would say bad causes that people internally were uncomfortable with. And yeah, they became more uncomfortable with Mercer. And it got to the point where Simons heard about it and he was worried about morale. And he had to, and I write about a scene in the book, he had to go to Mercer and say, you got to step down, not necessarily leave the firm, but you can't run the firm because our morale is getting hurt and we're worried about recruiting. So there's always this key question of, will we ever know how they've done what they've done? So the people there, the 330 people may have access to the code. But you have this guy who's an educator by heart, who's turned to his crack the code on the market. Do you think at any point in time as a book in his will someday, there will be a better understanding of what actually they done, even if it's only the competitive quants who can understand it? See, my argument is that there's no secret. It's a group of advantages they have over everybody else. And I do write in the book about things like how they hide their signals, they trade in ways where they try to make what they do hard for others to follow. They have a different understanding of trading and the relationships among equities and such. So I understand this need or this desire for like some huge, big reveal as to how, why they're so much better. But I don't know, talk to people internally, they do have signals that go back that are tried and true, that they think are going to continue to work. And they hide those signals and they try to trade in, in a way that people can't pick up on. And I'd love to hear more details about that. And I get into it a little bit in the book, but I still think it's sort of these small, important advantages in terms of the talent, in terms of the management, in terms of getting people to work together, in terms of the importance of data. And they do have better data than everybody else. People are catching up. It's not as much an advantage anymore, but they've got Stuff going back to the 1700s that's accurate and gives them patterns that people don't, don't necessarily see. So in terms of people giving stuff away, no. I mean, Simons didn't want me to write this book. Even a few months ago when we were like at the printer, he legitimately kind of asked me, hey, do you have to write this book? Our last meeting together, do you still have to write this book? So he might do something of his own someday, but I think it'd be more his approach to philanthropy and things like that. He ain't going to tell you his best signals. And how's your relationship evolved with him? It's complicated. Listen, he's been really generous with his time with me. We spent over 10 hours together. We'll email and he'll correct things. But that's usually things he wants to talk about. And that's not usually renaissance. It's his more recent endeavors, his early endeavors. So for a long time, he wouldn't talk to me. I got him to eventually sit down with me. We spent a number of sessions together He's still been friendly and generous with his time, and I think he's fine with the book. He's, he likes the book. Apparently, his wife likes it even more, I've been told. But it's complicated. Listen, they signed 30-page non-disclosures internally, so it's weird for him to be talking to me. And all things being equal, he doesn't need the fame, and he's got the fortune. So what does he need a book for? So we have a, a complicated relationship. But he did it. I have to give him credit. He did really help me in a lot of different ways. I've got this one example that maybe if I could call this up here, people might be interested in. I asked them, I was writing about a word called holonomy. Do you know what holonomy means by any chance? Not at all. So it's a concept in geometry, but like everything else in the book, it's complicated. And I mentioned briefly, but if I made one mistake, all the mathematicians in, in quants would be all over me. So I asked Simons if he could simply, and he's a former teacher and he was a really good teacher. So he's a plain spoken guy. I asked him, can you in a simple way, define holonomy for me. It could have been nicer. He emailed as follows. If it is helpful, holonomy may be defined as parallel transport of tangent vectors around closed curves in multiple dimensional curve spaces. This is him dumbing it down for me. So on the one hand, it was he couldn't have been nicer and he took the time to define it for me. On the other hand, I felt like Michael Scott in that scene where, uh, can you... Pretend I'm a three-year-old. So yeah, so we have a complicated relationship, but uh, I do thank and appreciate the time he spent with me. What did you cover in those 10 hours together? It ranged. <laughs> we talked about lots of stuff. Listen, I'm a curious guy. So yeah, we talked about his early life and his family. And I get into it and I wanted to kind of get the impact of his parents and 
life lessons. And Simons and I would talk about tension and crises that he went through, talk about his sons a little bit. So we talk about different periods of his life, including at Renaissance and stuff he was comfortable talking about. It wasn't that much, but we talk about that. And his most recent endeavors, which are just fascinating, he's also trying to figure out whether the Big Bang took place. And so I'm interested in that too, as we talk about that. They've got this big operation going on in Chile where they're trying to figure that kind of stuff out. His science and math and other efforts I find really interesting, his philanthropy. So we talk about that kind of thing too. Great. All right. Let's turn to a couple closing questions. Sure. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I'm a sports guy. So even my writing is all home runs and strikeouts. Not all. A lot of what I do is home runs and strikeouts. So I wrote two books with my two sons about sports stars who overcame challenges in their youth. And we may do another one. And it's a hobby that we try to inspire young people. And we give speeches. I'm giving one to some underprivileged children in a week or so. Yeah, we go and meet superstars and ask them about racism and sexual abuse and physical abuse and poverty and how they dealt with it. Because I think there are lessons for me and selfishly and for my kids, I really want them to learn and for other young people. So those books, we love doing those. And I watch sports and I play softball, I play basketball. So that's kind of my passion. What were those two books? They're called Rising Above. One were mostly male stars, people like LeBron James and Ari Dickey and Jim Abbott was born with one arm. So my youngest son was born with two fingers on his left hand. And that was part of the reason I did those books as well. I wanted him to meet some of these players like Jim Abbott, who had it much worse. And my youngest is doing great. He's a great star athlete locally and whatever, high school player, not go crazy, but whatever. But it, so it hasn't really held him back. And yet he buries his hand in his pocket a lot of the time. And there's an insecurity there. And that's part of the reason I wanted to do those books too. And so we went and met these players and we, we sat in the Yankee Stadium in the dugout talking to Ari Dickey. I don't know if you know him at all, but he was a pitcher, former for the Mets and Cy Young. And he was close to suicide earlier in his life. He'd been sexually abused twice by a family member and by a babysitter. And he got so carried away telling us the story and sharing it with my boys and with me that Troy Tulitsky, who's on Toronto, he had to tell us, to, sorry, guys, I, I got to go on and stretch on before a game. We were blocking him in the dugout. So, yeah, they're called Rising Above, and they've done nicely. I get letters from young people around the country, just, you know, they're dealing with their own stuff, and maybe the book helped them, a chapter on somebody, Steph Curry, other kinds of people overcame different things. So we write about those in those books. What's your biggest pet peeve? My biggest pet peeve is when a member of the White House goes on Twitter and doesn't capitalize and misspells. And <laughs> it's just sad for me. Um, for, set aside all the politics. I'm a writer and the little things bother me. And just just capitalize, put a apostrophe where it's supposed to be. Have somebody just check it. I love the English language. And a lot of what I do is obsess over in my basement at 2 a.m. when I'm figuring out what word I should choose. And you know, the leader of the free world is butchering the, the English language. And again, I'm not playing politics here whatsoever, but just as a writer. All right, what reading do you rarely miss? So every day I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the New York Post. So those are my go-to. I'm a slow reader, so I've got piles of newspapers I'm always carrying. And then I'll use Twitter a lot and print out and read recommendations from other people, places in, in Washington Post and such. But those are my three go-tos every day. All right, and so outside of reading stuff on Twitter, how do you use social media? I try not to get caught up in fights on Facebook, but and my wife tell me all oh, that. Why are you wasting your time? Because I've got some friends, close friends, who've got different political views than I do. So we'll go at it sometimes on social media, and it's a monumental waste of my time. And my wife always emphasizes that to me, and I can't help myself. And also, listen, I'm at the Wall Street Journal. You got to be careful. I love the paper because we play it down the middle, and whatever interest people have personally, we do really try to play it straight down the middle in every facet when it comes to finance and, and other kinds of things. So I don't do that much. I'll do a little Facebook, but I'm mostly Twitter. I'll do some LinkedIn, connecting with sources and getting tips and that kind of thing. I'll do Signal when I get those hot tips and WhatsApp, but mostly it's Twitter and mostly it's to interact and hear what's happening. What are people talking about? It gives me ideas. Yeah. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? So my father taught political science for many years, and he was a great writer, and he helped me cut and trim my writing. He was always slashing words and sentences and paragraphs and stuff and trying to narrow and focus my writing. So in terms of professionally, my writing, I would say that in terms of a lesson. And my mother was an obsessive newspaper reader, and that got to me. And just in terms of life lessons, 
it's all about family to me and prioritizing and community. So I guess in that regard, they left an impression on me as well. Okay, amidst all these conversations with these brilliant mathematicians and others, as it turns to you, what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? So I stumbled onto this thing, but I tell young people all the time to try to find some competitive advantage. And so I've got a competitive advantage to the extent that I love finance. There are a lot of people at Wall Street Journal that are smarter than I am and better writers, but there aren't that many that love finance like I do. I happen to love investing. And I think when I talk to people about it, they sense that. So that's sort of my competitive advantage that I'm in a place where more than others, I'm not in any way denigrating my colleagues. They do an amazing job, but that's my niche. My niche are investors. I love to talk to them about investing. It happens to be my passion. So I've got a competitive advantage. I remember the guy from Freakonomics, one of the two gave a speech about his father who was a doctor and he was the world's expert in some gastrointestinal embarrassing phenomenon of some kind. And yet he was flown around the world and made a lot of money. That was his niche, his competitive advantage. So to the extent that one can find something that you're just a little better than others at, I think it helps... It goes a long way. Greg, thanks so much for oh, taking the time. Great to be here. Great to and be here. Congrats on the book. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 